minute, a minute of retour. Um, let's wait one more minute. Okay, I think now the participants are stabilizing. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we have an amazing talk by uh, Peter Battaglia now. He's a research scientist at uh, DeepMind. Previously, he was a research scientist and a postdoc at uh, MIT. And he completed his PhD in University of Minnesota in cogn Cognitive um, uh, Biological uh, Psychology. And he's an expert on learning symbolic physics uh, with machine learning. So, uh, Peter, um, yeah, looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think we're going to. Just tell me if this goes full screen for you. Uh, not full screen yet. I can I can see your screen though. Yeah, perfect. It's full screen. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and, and just to, <clears throat> I have thirty minutes, and then there's like ten minutes for questions. Is that right? That's right, and I'll tell you five minutes before the thirty minutes are over. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so um, so thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. Um. Uh, so yeah, today <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about uh, is really like some of the work that my group and some of my collaborators have been doing um, to try to sort of bridge between machine learning and um, sort of physics, like what we know about physics. Uh, so generally there's this sort of idea <clears throat> some people have in the machine learning community that we should take all knowledge, you know, domain knowledge out. We should try to sort of make things very generic and um, uh, sort of agnostic to whatever the real problem that you're trying to solve is, um, this is sort of in contrast to that. So this is like how we can exploit good knowledge from physics um, in, ter in terms of inductive biases or choices of architectures um, and do better machine learning that way. And then vice versa, how we can use machine learning to maybe extract uh, new physical knowledge <clears throat> that are sort of difficult to access otherwise. So today, the, the you know, sort of start, uh, saying that, I want to sort of convince you of two things, um, that our knowledge of physics can improve our machine learning approaches. Um, I'm going to show several sort of uh, pieces of work that we're ho hopefully will kind of help, help convince you. Um, and two, that our machine learning tools can be used to improve our knowledge of physics, like I just said. Specifically, we're going to do things like use, <clears throat> uh, make choices about the representation or how to solve um, uh, you know, physical systems or learn simulations. Um, we're going to use inductive biases about uh, like sort of mechanics formulations, um, ODEs, Hamiltonian mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics. Uh, and then on the, on the other side, going back into physics, we're going to talk about how we can uh, do symbolic regression against trained models <clears throat> and use that to recover physical formulas and expressions. Um, we're also going to talk about how um, we can recover physical parameters, like semantically meaningful physical parameters um, if we structure our machine learning systems properly. Okay, so um, I have to give some quick background first because um, most of what I'm going to talk about is going to involve graph neural networks. So um, this is this is just a few slides. Um, so if you haven't you know encountered graph neural networks before, um, ho hopefully this can give you just like enough rough and ready information to get going. Um, so a graph neural network <coughs> is a type of deep learning architecture. Um, that takes as input a graph and, and basically predicts uh, different attributes on the nodes, edges, or even global sort of graph level properties. Um, so like this, this schematic down here is supposed to kind of demonstrate that. So you can have sort of funky, interesting graphs with like multiple edges between nodes and things like that. Um, it's going to go into this graph 
network. Uh, you can kind of just think about it as a black box for now. Um, and then at the outside, it's going to come. Uh, it's going to predict. This U is meant to represent sort of global level predictions, node level predictions, or edge level predictions. Okay. Um, and the specific type of graph neural network that I'm going to talk about today is something that my group has sort of uh, developed and use, uses pretty frequently. We call them just graph networks. Um, it's, it can be seen as sort of a generalization of some other approaches. So the way a graph network actually processes the input graph, um, it, it, you can kind of think about it as like learned message passing. So what happens is you take the input graph here and uh, the, there's a learned neural, there's a, a neural network function that's going to be applied to every little neighborhood. So this blue uh, sort of, uh, you know, loop, sort of, you know, oval around the pair of nodes connected by an edge represents a function, a neural network function, and that's phi e. And this function is going to take as input the attributes of the edge, that's ek, the um, attributes of the two nodes that are connected by the edge, and maybe some global property. And that function is going to predict a, pro a new property for that edge, okay? And that the graph neural network, the graph net, takes this edge function and sweeps it all over all the edges of the graph, applies the same function to every pair of nodes and, you know, connected by an edge. Um, in si similar ways as like a convolutional neural network it sweeps a single kernel around an image, the graph neural network sweeps a edge function all around the edges of a graph, okay? So that once you have those, we call these messages sometimes. So once you have these messages that have been computed um, from one node, from every node to the one that it's, send, that it's connected to by an edge, you then aggregate up these messages. So what happens is you say, well, all the edges that are incident on this node are going to, all, all the, all, all, sorry, all the edges that are incident, all the, the messages that have been computed over them are going to be aggregated with some kind of like summation or um, max operation, some kind of pooling operation to um, combine them. And then what we're going to do is apply a second neural network, this phi v function, to the node. So we're going to update that node's state by considering all the message messages it received and also the input state on that node um, and some global properties too, possibly. Um, and then and we, and we sweep this phi v function all over all the nodes of the graph again. So it's sort of convolutional over the nodes now. So the first was convolutional over the edges, then it's convolutional over the nodes. Now we've got updates for the edges and for the nodes. And finally, we can, uh, if we want, in some problems, you, know, you don't have to do this. You can sort of uh, make some of these choices are kind of optional, but you can do a global prediction. So you can pull up all the information that you computed about all the nodes and the edges and uh, put them into a third neural network, this phi u, and then predict something, a graph level property. <clears throat> and so now you can see how we go from an input graph structure and attributes into the output graph. So edges, nodes, and global features. Um, and again, this graph network that we've been working with, if you sort of, if you're familiar with the literature, you might have seen like things like transformers or message passing neural networks or deep sets or other things like this. You can think of a lot of these things as versions of a graph network where we kind of like remove inner, uh, certain types of connections or functions within the graph network block. So basically like for instance, for example, like a message passing neural network doesn't really have uh, a, a sense of an input global property and it doesn't have pooling from the edges up to the uh, to the global, like the full graph network block does, but in, in many ways it's sort of similar. And oftentimes you don't really need this sort of full expressivity. Um, the last thing I'll sort of say in this direction is um, like, you know, the sort of magic magic of modern deep learning is like you have these kind of high level languages, you know, TensorFlow or Keras and things like this. And you can just sort of think about like taking your neural network blocks as modules and stringing them together in different ways and um, creating different types of types of sort of composite functions. So you can like share the same graph network many, many times, kind of like, you know, iteratively apply it. You could have a sort of deep graph network where you have different graph network blocks stacked like kind of like a deep com net or something. Um, you could encode some input, run some processing on it and decode it, which you'll see me talk more about. Um, and again, like, if, you know, if you're familiar with sort of modern deep learning toolkits and libraries, it's, it's all sort of the same, you know, box and arrow uh, uh, sort of game. Okay, so that's the background on graph neural networks. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how uh, what we we some of the work we've been doing to simulate uh, to learn to simulate sort of complex systems, uh, specifically fluids, uh, meshes, some structural mechanics problems, um, and all the learning simulation stuff that I'll talk about follows a very sim similar template. Um, we are always going to just take the some physical system and represent it uh, as a graph, and we're going to make predictions about the next step in time 
and then we're going to um, update the state and then sort of uh, run that forward in time to create a trajectory. So it's, it's basically how a physics engine, most physics engines work. Um, and here this S, uh, S theta is meant to represent this learned simulator. And here I've sort of broken this up. So the update box is sort of like an integrator or something like this. And the D is like the dynamics model, the learned dynamics model parameterized by theta, which are going to be like your parameters of your neural network. Um, OK, so actually, I'll just kind of cut right to this. So the way that we often do this, and this is some work that was uh, led by um, Alvaro Sanchez and Toby Pfaff and Rex Yang and John Godwin, and we published it last year at ICML. Um, we're trying to learn fluid simulations. We're going to represent the fluids as particles. So the way it works is you take the particle positions. Each, each particle has a state vector, um, xi, which concludes its position and velocity, uh, maybe some properties like uh, viscosity or things like this, material properties. We're going to compute uh, nearest neighbors uh, and then construct a graph out of that. So all this uh, for this particle, all of its nearest particles, we're going to put edges into a, you know, connected to uh, other nearby particles with um, edges. And that's sort of meant to be this like gray circle. And then the, the edges I've added, um, and that's like this encoder block. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna take the input state, and we're gonna also project them into some sort of latent vector space that's gonna be all learned, um, some like you know indecipherable neural network uh, representation space, and that's G not. Um, so now you have a graph. It's we've embedded the uh, you know meaningful input positions as sort of latent vectors using a learned function, and then we're gonna run a process or a, a graph network block. Um, uh, about usually about 10 times, um, pass messages around the uh, nodes and edges of the graph, like I described a second ago. Um, this is actually, we use a sort of like residual connection. So you kind of predict changes to the input graphs attributes. Um, and then finally, after you're finished with your uh, message passing, you then are going to take this latent representation, this graph with latent attributes, there's some high dimensional vector space, and you're going to just take uh, per node just decode them. So you're going to predict, pr predict like a change in the state, like the position and velocity uh, at each node position. So that's meant to be represented here. So you take that output graph, and then for each node, which represents a particle, you predict like how that particle state will change in the next time step. And we're going to train it with supervised learning. So we're going to it's sort of like just a, a, a complicated regression problem. We're just going to regress, you know, take learn like simulated data from a ground truth simulator, uh, take trajectories, cut them up into little pairs of you know, input states, output states, and then we're going to optimize the parameters of the neural network so that the input state, so that it can take an input state and predict accurately the output state that would have come out of the simulator, the true simulator. Okay, um, and we're excited about these kinds of ideas because we think that if we can get learned models to maybe like down, like down sample uh, or um, uh, you know, run fast or to make all kinds of, we have lots of knobs we can uh, turn to try to get these models to maybe be more efficient um, or maybe generalize, or maybe we can generalize to larger things that are trained on and things like that. And that could maybe provide advantages over learned, uh, over existing simulators. Um, so when we do that with our sort of water simulation, this is what we get. Um, so it's sort of choppy on my screen, so I'm sure it's choppy on yours. It's kind of, I'll just move it forward in time. So um, this is like the underlying particle representation of this fluid. Uh, on the left, you have the true simulator's trajectory of particles. And on the right, you have the learned simulator's trajectory of particles. And again, each of the particles on the right, uh, its position on every time step is just predicted by this graph neural network-based simulator. Um, see. So uh, when you see like the kind of surface in these videos, we've done some post-processing with like a, gra uh, a simulation package to just like put like a sort of surface on, on the particle representation. But from the, learn, the machine learning model's perspective, it's always a particle system. Um, that's water. We can do this with like sand, so we can change the material properties in the ground truth simulator. Um, I can see that this is very choppy on my screen, so I don't know if you can really see this. It's too bad. Um, but again, here's the sort of particle representation of the, of the system. We can do this with this material that we call goop. So we just sort of mess around with the uh, viscosity and other material parameters of these. Um, in, in the ground truth simulator, generate trajectories, train models on it, and, and get things like this. Um, we can also do things like uh, have you know more complex obstacle systems. So here we've like trained the model to. Um, this video is not working that well anymore. And um, we do have. I can point at the end. Yes, there's references um, with links, and you can. We have like a, a, a site with videos if you want to kind of see these. Um, 
But anyway, so you can see on the left, you've got the ground truth, and the right, you've got the simulator. And it's, it's very accurate. These models can be, like these learned models can be very accurate, really replicate the ground, the ground truth simulator quite well. Um, we can also do things like generalize. So here we trained it on a very small system of particles that's like a sort of a small box of particles with very simple interactions among different materials. But because the graph networks are sort of, again, because they're convolutional, because they're the, the locus of learning, the learned functions are just thinking about the interactions. They're just looking at the interactions between local particles. As long as we get those local interactions right, we should be able, in principle, we should be able to sort of um, create much more complicated systems um, at test time after training, and the model should work on them because the physics are sort of the same. And all, of, all the model sees is the kind of local interactions. It's just making local predictions, just like an actual simulator. Um, and that's, you know, for the same reason that actually, you know, ground truth simulator, you know, hand engineered simulators, um, you know, can often uh, be applied to a wide range of domains The learning simulators have a similar property. Um, I apologize again for the choppiness of the video. Um, we can even do things that have like fluids with like solid part of like, uh, objects floating around. All you've done here is just tagged in the uh, data that these green box particles are like a rigid material. And then the model just can kind of like figure out that it should hold its position, uh, its relative you know, coordinate positions together. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna kind of just go through this next one. So this is more recent work at iClear. Very similar ideas I just described, but instead of fluids, uh, particle-based fluids, what we did was uh, mesh mesh-based uh, uh, sort of simulations. So here um, we're, we're using like these sort of cloth uh, systems, these structural mechanics systems, um, compressible fluids and incompressible fluid flow. Okay, so very similar uh, model, very similar sort of general idea. Um, a few differences are that because the mesh actually has some connectivity, like which parts of the cloth are attached to which parts, we have, multi, we have two types of edges in the simulator. So now it's not just the edges that are the local neighborhoods around a particle that it, the particle interacts with. It's also the particle's actual neighbors in the input mesh. Um, and we also do things like we, in, in graphics, like there's like, or in you know, lots of sort of engineering domains, you have adaptive mesh refinement, different kinds of um, mesh adaptation schemes to try to improve the quality of the numerical simulation. Uh, and we can actually run those algorithms within our system so we could say like we can also just change the mesh as we're um, you know at, at test time we're rolling out a trajectory the same way they would we've also done things like tried to learn the uh, mesh re refinement strategy in a neural network as well and see if we can predict it and that does work as well so that again offers uh, options for maybe doing things like trying to learn a better mesh refinement strategy with a with an objective that we care about um, we sort of have just started exploring this um, one thing that's really cool about this too is that this system is about 10 to 100 times faster than the simulator on which it was trained. So this kind of gets exciting for us that we might be able to improve the, or you know, have, have advantages with these learned models. And so far as they're accurate, we might be able to do things a lot faster, especially solving like inverse problems and things like that. Um, and we're starting to explore that now. Um, so here's some examples of, of cloth waving in the wind. Um, on the left, you've got your ground truth um, uh, simulator of the cloth. On the right, you've got this. Um, the one that our model is predicting, and this is with the learned remeshing. So it's it, it's not that easy to see, but if you look closely, you'll see that the mesh uh, itself is actually changing as the simulation proceeds, and that's also being predicted by um, a model. And I, I don't have time to get the details of that now, but we, you can check out the paper. Um, here's the structural mechanics. So on the left, ground truth engine, right is our predictions. Um, here's the uh, fluid flow compressible on the left, uh, incompressible on the right. So you got like your sort of airfoil on the left. It's like air compressible fluid. On the right, you've got your cylinder and you know some like water or something like this. Um, here, the mesh coordinates are actually fixed, but now we're changing things like the pressure and um, velocities. Um, we can also do things like generalize to much larger systems than those in which we were trained. So on the top left, we were training on systems that were kind of like a simple flag, but then we create all kinds of different flags, you know, these fish flags that are kind of funny edges. And um, in this case, on the, on the right, it, the, I don't know if it shows it in this video. Yeah, you can see the training on the bottom left there. It was trained on a much smaller mesh, and it can generalize to a much larger one very accurately. Okay, so that's, that's the sort of types of, you know, where we've gotten just kind of learning simulations, hoping to try to get more efficient. Um, maybe we can uh, more, you know, uh, generalize in interesting ways um, that, uh, that, that engineered simulators can't. Um, 
so next time, and, and again, just to kind of weave back into the original theme, the what's the, the physical inductive bias here is is like the structure of the system, right? That like that, th that you can represent it with a with particles or a mesh, and we can um, compute physical interactions locally, and then sort of let the like overall dynamics of the system emerge from getting the local uh, dynamics right. And that's you know again how most simulators work. Um, so we're sort of uh, taking a, a strong cue from existing kind of numerical simulation techniques in order to build these learned things rather than just sort of putting everything into one big vector or something like that and hoping that like an RNN can solve it. Um, uh, okay, five. so the next. We'll go. What's up? Yeah. How much? Five. Oh, five minutes? Oh. It, yeah. Or 10. Oh. Yes. 10. Yeah, sorry. Have... Yeah. Is that? Uh, okay, cool. I'll hurry up anyway. Um, Okay, so two more, so two papers I want to describe now is a, is a sort of a slightly different example. So instead of just thinking about how to do numerical um, uh, integration, we're going to take um, models of mechanics from physics. So in physics, what you really, what you often have is like, you can kind of think about some, you know, uh, the data is often generated out of process where you have some particles or some representations, you know, it goes through this black box, which we call physics, and it predicts things that are going to happen in the future. So like the position and momentum. Um, of the particles, the next time step, for example. And the stuff I showed before, I, I'm labeling interaction that it sort of follows this general scheme that we had published several years ago, this interaction network approach. We basically just try to predict the next, like, like a change in position or change in momentum velocity at the next time step and just add it to the input position. Um, <clears throat> but but what we, a, a slightly different approach would be to train a function that actually represents the instantaneous time derivatives of the position and momentum. Okay, so this would be treating with like sort of thinking about uh, this as an ODE and then having some type of integrator or maybe even trying different integrators. Um, so instead of predicting like an, uh, 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 um, like the, the, the position and momentum change in a fixed time step delta t, again, instantaneous, so, uh, we're sort of gonna give, we're gonna train a function that can be given to an integrator, like a neural network function, give it to an integrator. And then the integrator can do whatever it wants to query in different ways to build up its, um, you know, next time steps prediction. Uh, and so this is sort of like how an ODE tends to work. Um, like you have your sort of input, you know, initial conditions, and you have some function that predicts time derivatives, um, and then an integrator will take that. So we we develop what we call like this ODE graph network, where the idea is the graph network is going to be a predictor of the like this this function in yellow is going to be predicted by a graph network. Um, or the Hamiltonian ODE graph network, where what we're going to do is uh, predict a scalar, which we're going to call H, and then we're going to impose semantic, like the semantics of Hamiltonian mechanics on it by basically taking it, taking its partial derivative with respect to the input momentum and the input position, and you know, sort of abiding by Hamilton's equations, we're going to say, well, the partial derivative of the scalar with respect to the, the momentum is the, is the time derivative of the position. And the partial derivative of the scalar with respect to the input position, the negative of that will be what we're gonna call the time der derivative of the momentum. And we can give it, so if this yellow thing is now the function, we can give these things to an integrator. We've effectively learned a Hamiltonian for this system. So this is like Hamiltonian mechanics. Um, and uh, I just sort of wanted to reference this. Kyle Cranmer uh, was sort of in, uh, had sort of inspired like a lot of this work and was a co-author in this. And also, this is very similar to stuff that uh, Sam Gradonis had done in his Hamiltonian Neural Networks uh, paper, it's sort of in parallel. So here's an example of, uh, why, of, of what happens when you do this. So here's the ground truth simulation. We've just taken one of the particles out. Here's a look, we've isolated it. Here's the true integrating the true Hamiltonian. Here's if we did that interaction network approach, like in the particle and mesh simulations I sort of described. So you see at some point it starts to decohere, like after many, many steps, it starts to lose track of the ground truth. Um, but when you, uh, what we can do is use like higher order integrators or uh, 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 and the ODE or the Hamiltonian ODE versions, and we can get sort of better coherence between the ground truth and the um, prediction. I don't really have that much time to get into some of this, but basically the, the main things that we've tried are just we've kind of like looked at how well the um, these different approaches how accurate they are and how also they like preserve energy in the uh, in the system and you can see in general it's like the blue like if, if these are uh, on the on the y-axis you've got like error the blue which is this types of approaches I showed originally in the talk the interaction error approach both have most more error in the predictive accuracy and in like uh, maintaining uh, energy accurately 
And another thing we can do is generalize. So I was talking about generalization before. We can generalize to different time steps because we have the instantaneous derivatives now. So the blue is the you know older sort of stuff we've done, which doesn't generalize to making uh, to predictions at different time steps. But the green and the red, these ODE and Hamiltonian um, learned simulators, we can vary the time step. That's the x-axis, and we still get pretty good uh, performance on the y-axis, we much lower error um, for outside of the time steps that you trained on outside of the gray. Um, OK, yeah, I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to kind of hustle through this. So no, five um, minutes, sorry. Yeah, five minutes. <laughs> so um, another thing we've, uh, in a very similar spirit, we've done something, we've done a Lagrange neural network paper. So here, instead of just assuming uh, inductive bias from uh, Hamilton's equations, Hamiltonian mechanics, we've used Lagrangian mechanics. Um, so here you have to do a little more manipulation of uh, uh, um, the, the, of the sort of like in order to get the first and second derivatives of the uh, state. Um, and I, I don't really have time to get into this, but you can read the paper. But again, um, it's just another sort of, we're just, again, trying to explore how can we take, you know, strong inductive biases from physics and pose them on our um, uh, neural networks and then, uh, and then you know, learn dynamics and things like this. So this is sort of how we go from the Euler-Lagrange equation into the, uh, the time derivatives, the, second, the first and second time derivatives that we need for the integrator. Um, and you can do a lot of this automatically with like JAX or TensorFlow because they can do auto, auto differentiation on these things, um, which, which is pretty nice. Um, and what you get when you do this is um, what's interesting. So we can sort of compare it to the Hamiltonian uh, uh, approaches. Um, and so one thing that's nice is that in Lagrangian mechanics, you don't need to have canonical uh, coordinates or canonical momentum at least. Um, and uh, that means that like in some cases, like if you have arbitrary, you don't know the uh, coordinates, then you can um, you can still basically learn uh, the uh, learn to do the simulation. So in a Hamiltonian setting, if you just sort of are given some state um, is in some, some arbitrary state and you don't know what to, like in Hamilton's equations, you need to know what to take the partial de derivatives with respect to in order to apply Hamilton's equations, but you don't need that in the Lagrangian uh, version. So you don't need to know what parts of the input state are like momentum or uh, position. Um, and the thing I just showed was not actually using graph networks. It was just using a sort of standard neural network. So we've also applied this to graph networks as well. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm going to have to move because I want to get to the next part, which I think is uh, sort of newer stuff that's more interesting. Okay, so the last thing I want to show is how we can go from um, backwards and from, from machine learning, use machine learning to help discover physics, uh, you know, physics equations or formulas or um, just other kinds of descriptions of physical systems. Um, so. What we've been doing, we have several projects now where we've been um, doing the same thing. We're training some simulator on particle simulations or other types of simulations like dark matter simulations. Um, and, uh, and if we do this with like sort of charged particles, this is this video sort of shows like a, an example of like a model that's been of, of these kind of crazy charged particle systems that we create. Um, and but what we're going to do now is once we've trained this model, we're going to do a second step. We're going to try to apply symbolic regression to it, and we're going to extract symbolic expressions for the learned, uh, for, for, for sort of physically meaningful parts of the model. And I'll explain that now. Um, so when you look at, like, I, I sort of, did, I said, when I set this up and I said we, you know, we're passing messages around these graph neural networks and stuff, if you think about it, these messages could be thought of as forces. Like, that's what forces are, right? Like, in, in, in sort of classical mechanics, it's like you have some particle, you have some other particle, and they're communicating something between each other that's force and then they're updating their own states on the basis of whatever the like interaction the, the, their, their interaction was um, so what we can do is by using graph neural networks we can say well that, that edge function that uh, computes interactions between pairs of particles maybe that's maybe we can kind of impose biases to like have it predict things that are in the spatial like has the right spatial dimensionality as the input like 3d we'll have 3d outputs of those and we'll say those are we're going to Say so maybe those are forces. We're going to kind of impose mechanics assumptions that mean that that get that, that force the edge functions to represent forces. Okay. So the way that works is we, sorry. So what we do is we basically um, say this edge model phi e is going to represent force, and then we do symbolic regression. So we train the simulator, but then we we take the edge function phi e out of the simulator. And start and use it as a data generator. And we're going to do symbolic regression using a genetic algorithm, and that's going to help. Us, that's going to allow us to build up a tree that represents a symbolic expression. So, like, if it's a force formula that's something like this, that it can be 
regressed uh, that you know the structure of that that, that discrete sort of uh, formula can be it can be regressed against using again the genetic algorithm it's going to run lots of different pieces of data through the neural network it's going to see what the output is and it's going to start to fit a symbolic expression to that and if you're interested in this you can look at miles Kramer, the first author he also in part of his work he developed this pi sr pi symbolic regression library you can uh, do this with um, so this video sort of illustrates this whole process um, so basically what you're seeing here is or as the video proceeds um, you're you, you, on the you're seeing the model train getting better and better at training and we keep refitting um, symbolic expressions to the force functions and over time it the force the learned force function if this symbolic expression that we've extracted from our simulator starts to have a perfect correlation with what we know to be the true force function. Um, and that's what this is supposed to represent. So you can see more like as this line, as you get this sort of perfect correlation, that's, that means that our learned symbolic expression is producing the exact same input uh, outputs as the true force law in various different systems. So we tried like springs and these different charged particle systems. Um, we also did like play the same game with the Hamiltonian. So now can we extract the uh, symbolic expression for the Hamiltonian and we can. Um, so this is a sort of proof of concept that we can discover compact symbolic expressions from detailed simulations. And the reason we don't just do symbolic regression uh, on the raw data is because it's, first of all, we need to do the symbolic regression within the sort of model. We need like to isolate it to that force function, edge function. Um, and uh, it's also, we, like, we, but we can play games in the neural network to reduce the dimensionality that would otherwise be difficult to do with, uh, in the gene with the genetic algorithms directly. And again, we can talk about that later if you want. Um, we can also try this approach on detailed simulations where we don't really know good symbolic expressions for what's happening at a high level. So here, what we're showing is these, we're showing these, doing these dark matter halo simulations. We can actually get expressions that weren't previously published before, but that are more accurate at describing um, the, uh, um, uh, it's the over is over density than uh, the previous known, the best known formulas for this, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the last thing I know, I'm basically out of time, I'm going to take like one or two more minutes. Um, the last thing I'm going to show is we've also started applying this idea to real data. So rather than taking simulations and seeing if we can learn force laws from them, where in some cases we already know what the force laws or what the Hamiltonians are, we're going to see if we can take real data and extract symbolic expressions. So the way we do this is we've, um, and what I'll show you now is we've done this with orbital mechanics of the solar system. Um, we want to do two things. We want to see if we can estimate the masses of the orbital bodies, first of all, and we also want to see if we can recover Newtonian gravity. Um, so there's this like data set of 33 years of trajectories in their solar system. Um, we do our standard thing. We train a graph net based simulator on the trajectories of our actual solar system, uh, training on the first 30 years of the data set and validating in the last three years. Um, and that's and then we get trajectories over here on the right that look pretty accurate, um, very accurate, actually. Um, the first thing we do is we want to see if we can, uh, without observing the masses, we only observe the position and velocities of the body, can we extract the masses, we can estimate the masses of the bodies. So the way we do that is we have a scalar with inside, within our neural network model, and we sort of apply force equals ma. So the scalar is going to represent m, and we're going to multiply it by, uh, or sorry, divide, we're going to divide f by m, by the scalar. And then we're going to use the outcome of that, the output of that, as we're going to give that to like this. They're going to target that as the measured uh, acceleration. So we know the acceleration. We're going to have the acceleration be computed by force equals ma, and the m is going to be a, a, a variable that's going to be optimized during the, uh, while we train it. And what's interesting is that we get we recover the relative masses of all the planets, uh, or most of the planets, and most of the moons too, quite accurately with respect to the sun except for Mercury and Venus. And this makes sense because Mercury and Venus don't have moons and they don't really have much impact on many other things in the solar system. So their masses are sort of unidentifiable from strictly the kinematic data alone. Um, uh, it's not, I mean, in principle, you should be able to estimate it, but it's much, much noisier and, and it's a much more subtle signal. Um, so this is showing that we can actually discover hidden physical parameters from real observations. The last thing I'll say is we supply the same symbolic regression procedure I described before to this same model. And we also get out Newton's formula for gravity, which is quite interesting, right? So now we've shown that we can actually extract a real symbolic expression from real data um, without having to have known it ahead of time. We only had to know force equals ma. Um, so that's sort of the last uh, last bit of this talk. We can discover symbolic expressions from real observations. Cool. Okay. So 
I wanted to convince you of two things, that we can improve our machine learning by um, exploiting knowledge of physics, and we can also start to improve our knowledge of physics by exploiting machine learning. Um, so I'm, I'll just open up the questions, uh, and, uh, and yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Sorry, I went a few minutes over. Um, and I'm going to leave on the slide that has my collaborators and some, um, we also have all, a lot of this code is open source. Um, 